In the serene community of Naples, Florida, tranquility was shattered by the unsettling disappearances of two men under eerily similar circumstances. Felipe Santos, a 23-year-old Mexican national, had made the U.S. his home for three years, working diligently to establish a life in a new land. In contrast, Terrence Williams, a 27-year-old father and Tennessee native, sought a fresh beginning in Naples, drawn closer to his family and the promise of new opportunities. Welcome to As Told by Bells, where mysteries unfold, the bizarre becomes a reality, and strange stories come to life. I'm Bells, your guide into the world of the unexplained. Each week, we'll delve into unsolved mysteries that continue to baffle and tell so bizarre you won't believe they actually happened. To stay in the loop with every captivating story, make sure to hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and ring that notification bell. Trust me, you don't want to miss a single episode of these extraordinary stories we're about to unravel. Now let the storytelling begin. Felipe Santos was 23 years old when he disappeared. Originally from a small town in Mexico, he regularly communicated with his parents back home. Known for his quiet and polite demeanor, Felipe had a distinctive hairstyle with most of his hair cut short, aside from a single long strand that he kept braided. Recently, Felipe had begun a new chapter in his life, living in Naples with his fiance and their baby daughter. Embracing fatherhood, he cherished his time with his family and was not one to frequent social outings. His routine primarily involved commuting to his job. Felipe was employed in agricultural work and was diligently saving money, likely with the future of his young family in mind. Shortly before 7 o'clock a.m. on October 14, 2003, Felipe Santos was driving to the masonry company where he worked with two other men, including one of his brothers. He got into a fender bender with another driver, Camille Lack, who then called the police. Although he had lived in Florida for three years, Santos was originally from Mexico and was undocumented. As a result, he had no driver's license or registration. Officer Calkin, the responding officer, cited Santos for driving without a license, driving without registration, and reckless driving. Calkins then put Santos in the back of the cruiser and drove away. Later that day, Santos's brother and his work supervisor arrived at the county jail to bail him out under the impression that he had been arrested. However, Santos was not there and there was no record of him being in police custody that day. In addition to his brother, his family began searching for him. He also had family members living in the Oaxaca region of Mexico and the Mexican embassy would eventually become involved in the mystery of what had happened to him. The search quickly circled back to the Collier County Sheriff's Department and Stephen Calkins, the last person known to have seen Santos. This sequence of events triggered the initial investigation into Deputy Calkins' conduct, which wrapped up shortly before the investigation concerning Terrence Williams' disappearance began. The investigation into Felipe Santos' case yielded inconclusive results, leaving authorities with no option but to accept Calkins' account at face value. Calkins claimed that to prevent Santos from regaining access to his car, he transported him to a nearby Circle K where he left him to use a payphone. Just months after Santos' disappearance, Terrence Williams, a 27-year-old father of four, vanished under strikingly similar circumstances. Terrence Williams, known for his warm smile and kind demeanor, lived a life marked by simplicity and dreams. An avid reader, he often found solace in the philosophies of Socrates, pondering the depths of wisdom and morality. His childhood memory, a scar from a playful mishap with matches, was a testament to his curious and adventurous spirit. Terence's life in Naples was punctuated by his hard work across two jobs, a testament to his dedication to forge a path for himself. Despite the challenges, his aspirations remained undimmed, driven by a love for his community and a desire to contribute meaningfully. 
Williams had relocated to Florida to be closer to his family when he vanished following an encounter with Calkins. Williams' car was later discovered at a towing company, with Calkins having signed the tow order but claiming no recollection of the incident. However, witnesses at a cemetery provided a conflicting narrative, having observed Williams and Calkins together before Williams was taken away in a patrol car. This incident not only sparked renewed scrutiny into Williams' disappearance, but also cast a new light on the case of Santos, exposing a disturbing pattern associated with Calkins. The exact time Calkins first encountered Williams on January 12, 2004, remains unknown, as Calkins failed to report the traffic stop to dispatch while it was in progress. It wasn't until a week later that Calkins documented the event, claiming to have seen Williams' white Cadillac at approximately 12.15 p.m. However, at least three witnesses contradicted this timeline, indicating that the traffic stop occurred before 10 a.m., potentially as early as 9 a.m., which is significantly earlier than Calkins' later statement. This discrepancy is further complicated by the fact that Williams was due to start his work shift at Pizza Hut at 10 a.m. that same day. During the traffic stop at Naples Memorial Garden Cemetery, witnessed by Jeff Cross, a family service counselor at the cemetery, both men exited their vehicles. Mr. Cross observed the deputy searching Williams, who signaled his lack of a driver's license by repeatedly patting his pockets and raising his hands. Subsequently, Calkins placed Williams in the back of his patrol car and drove away. Calkins' report later suggested that he took Williams to a Circle K, insinuating that Williams either worked there or nearby, which was inaccurate. Williams' actual workplace was a pizza hut located over two miles away from the Circle K, negating any logical reason for Williams to request a ride to the Circle K. Moreover, there was no evidence to confirm Williams' presence at the Circle K on that day. Mr. Cross, witnessing Calkins driving away with Williams, anticipated that Williams would be arrested for lacking a license or valid vehicle registration. Hence, he was astonished when, eight days later, a detective inquired about Williams' disappearance. Later that day, after 12 noon, Calkins returned to the cemetery to arrange for Williams' Cadillac to be towed. At 12.49 p.m., he made a recorded call to dispatch, which was answered by Corporal Dave Jolicoeur, a colleague from North Naples who was temporarily manning the dispatch desk. In the conversation, Deputy Calkins, identifying himself as 1 Alpha 30 North Naples requested a vehicle identification number check from Corporal Jolicoeur, who was on the dispatch desk. The exchange began with a lighthearted banter about a fee for the service, which they joked about. Following the joke, Calkins used an inappropriate and unprofessional accent, referring to the car as belonging to an African-American and providing false signals indicating the vehicle was abandoned and disabled. Despite knowing these descriptions were inaccurate, Calkins informed Jolly Cor that he was towing the Cadillac, which he derogatorily referred to as a big old white piece of junk. They continued to joke inappropriately about the situation. The conversation raised suspicions, especially after Williams was reported missing, leading to both deputies being reprimanded for their conduct. Shortly after 1 p.m., Deputy Calkins reached out to dispatch again, this time providing new details. Up until this point, he hadn't brought up Terrence Williams' name in earlier communications about the Cadillac at the cemetery. However, at 1.12 p.m., he made a request for a warrants check on Terrence D. Williams, providing a birth date of April 1st, 1975. This development intrigued investigators, as the date provided was not Williams' actual birth date, but a false one he occasionally used to mislead the police. Importantly, there were no official records accessible to Calkins that would have listed this incorrect birth date. 
Sergeant Mike Koval from the Collier County Sheriff's Office noted it seemed Calkins had interacted with Williams again. Calkins ticket issuance was notably low, averaging about one per month in the previous year. Yet he claimed to have issued two tickets on the day Williams vanished. These alleged stops happened during the periods when Calkins might have encountered Williams. One at 9.50 a.m., coinciding with the cemetery worker's initial sighting of Calkins with Williams, and another at 1.54 p.m., shortly after the dispatch call about Williams' incorrect birth date. If the second traffic stop was fabricated and considering Calkins' accounted presence at a residential alarm call, at 2.51 p.m., there was a gap of nearly two hours in the afternoon when Calkins' movements and actions remained unaccounted for. Following Williams' disappearance, his mother contacted various institutions, jails, hospitals, morgues, and mental health facilities, searching for her son to no avail. Her search extended to junkyards, where she discovered the Cadillac had been towed from the cemetery. This led her back to the cemetery staff, who confirmed they had seen a deputy sheriff taking Terrence away. As the investigation unfolded, law enforcement officers diligently combed through the forest and waterways near the locations where the two men were last spotted. They installed a tracking device on Calkins' vehicle and conducted a thorough forensic analysis with a keen focus on the trunk. Despite these efforts, no evidence of Santos or Williams were uncovered. The sheriff's investigative team meticulously reviewed and gathered evidence and concluded that Calkins' account of his interaction with Terrence Williams was not credible. An investigator compiled a list of almost 20 statements from Calkins regarding his encounter with Williams that were either false or inconsistent. In August 2004, Roughly seven months after Williams vanished, then-Sheriff Don Hunter terminated Calkins' employment, citing a loss of confidence in Calkins' ability to accurately report and remember events. Subsequently, the FBI issued a target letter to Calkins, inviting him to provide testimony to a federal grand jury concerning the disappearances. Calkins chose not to comply. Despite the mounting suspicions, investigators were unable to establish sufficient grounds to consider these incidents as hate crimes or criminal acts. As time progressed, the cases remained unresolved, with the children of the missing men growing up in their absence. Calkins consistently refuted any allegations of causing harm to the men and was never formally charged with any criminal offense. Sometime after he was fired from the sheriff's office, Calkins took a job at a local UPS facility. He worked there until 2013. Investigators kept tabs on Calkins and learned in 2016 that he and his wife had sold their house and moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The investigations into missing persons faced many problems, especially with the conflicting stories from Officer Calkins and the lack of clear evidence. People in the community started to doubt the police as the investigations didn't seem to move forward, leaving many important questions without answers. The families of Santos and Williams felt deep distress as they dealt with the complicated legal and investigative process, trying to find out what happened to their loved ones. During a challenging time, the Naples community came together, united in their call for justice and accountability. The city buzzed with vigils and protests, and news coverage highlighted important issues like police conduct and minority rights. Influential people and activists joined in, showing that these matters are important nationwide and stressing the need for major police reforms. The media paid close attention to these cases, with different programs and articles emphasizing the incidents. This media spotlight strengthened the demand for justice and spread the story to more people. Well-known figures such as Tyler Perry and civil rights attorney Ben Crump offered their support to the families involved, using their influence to encourage action. Tyler Perry's $200,000 reward offer for information that could resolve these cases shown a deep commitment to uncovering the truth. As you might expect, a number of different theories emerged 
One prevalent theory posits that these disappearances stem from a misuse of authority, possibly exacerbated by racial prejudices. Considering the similar conditions surrounding the disappearances of the two men, one Hispanic and the other African American, Following their interactions with Calkins, there is speculation that racial factors may have played a role in their outcomes. This speculation is intensified by claims of inadequate investigation and a lack of accountability from the involved law enforcement agency. The Starlight Tour theory, frequently mentioned regarding these incidents, refers to a troubling tactic where people, especially those from unrepresented groups, are taken to secluded areas by police and left there. Advocates of this theory believe that Santos and Williams might have been abandoned in such remote spots, leaving them stranded and contributing to their vanishings. Yet the unique landscape of Florida and the particular details of these cases complicate this theory, sparking debate about its plausibility. Another theory, less ominous but still highly conjectural, suggests that Santos and Williams could have entered witness protection or decided to assume new identities and begin fresh lives elsewhere. This perspective provides a more hopeful scenario yet there's minimal evidence backing this idea. Moreover, it doesn't reconcile the numerous inconsistencies and unresolved aspects in Calkins' descriptions of the events. This theory proposes that a standard police encounter may have unintentionally escalated, causing harm which was then concealed. It suggests that an ordinary police procedure could have taken a wrong turn, accidentally resulting in harm to Santos or Williams, or potentially both, with subsequent actions taken to hide the accident. The irregularities in Calkins' account and the dubious nature of the disappearances add a degree of plausibility to this scenario. All these theories highlight the deep complexity and distressing aspects of the Santos and Williams cases. They mirror wider societal issues related to confidence in law enforcement, the experiences of minority groups, and how accountability functions within the judicial system. As people keep speculating, the absolute truth still remains hidden. It's crucial to maintain focus and keep investigating these cases. This is not only to possibly discover new facts, but also to make sure we closely examine and learn from these troubling incidents. Doing so is key to achieving justice and preventing such events from happening again in the future. The mysterious cases of Felipe Santos and Terrence Williams highlight ongoing issues with transparency and fairness in policing, not just in Naples, but everywhere. As people keep looking for answers, their dedication to finding the truth shines like a beacon of hope. It reminds us how important every single person is and shows our shared duty to ensure justice and responsibility, especially in the face of adversity. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the mysteries of the unexplained. Remember to subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on every captivating story we uncover. Until next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. Stay tuned for more stories from As Told by Bells.